Tonight, uh, we have our evening with series. It's a special uh, night that we have planned. Normally, uh, we have one featured guest uh, for this particular series, but tonight we have three talented local artists um, presenting Alexis Hunley. We have Gregory Prescott and Kwam Odunsi, which will be uh, talking this evening. And our moderator, Ibarin Xperello, will be introducing them. Uh, so welcome to our guests and welcome everyone uh, tonight. Ibarinix uh, is a longtime friend, supporter of LACP. He's currently on faculty and he also serves on our board of advisors. Uh, if you're not familiar with his podcast, The Candid Frame, I highly encourage you to check this out. It's a wonderful resource. Um, I mean, on a weekly basis, Ibarinix, he brings in in-depth, intimate, thoughtful conversations with photographers living a photographic life. If you have not seen this, please do so. It's a great, great podcast. A wonderful person, an excellent voice. <laughs> Ibarinix, the floor is yours, my friend. All right, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Jason and everybody at LACP uh, for the invitation to, to host this event tonight. I'm really honored to have a chance to um, introduce some very talented local photographers who happen to be of color. Um, I think it's always um, a, a very exciting and important thing to be able to um, provide a platform for these photographers to share their work and why they do it. Um, I, I want to just share a quick anecdote. Uh, several years back, I was at a big photo event in LA and there was a, a person there who was a you know, pretty, pretty prominent, prominent curator. And he came up to me and uh, he'd been doing a little drinking. So I think uh, he was a little more honest than he might have been normally. And he asked me basically about, you know, where he could find, you know, black photographers whom didn't have an agenda when it came to their work. You know, that, that the issue of being black wasn't such a prominent part of their photography and it was you know the absurdity of of the question and um and sort of the the sadness that that you know someone who was in a position to be able to promote work of photographers in in you know in the very community that i live in uh, was very sort of disheartening um you know and and to ask, you know, the, the the idea of that a black photographer or Asian photographer or a gay photographer can somehow strip an aspect of their of themselves from their work is as impossible as asking them to strip that very thing from how they have to navigate the culture and the society that they live in. It's possible. It can't happen. That being said, I think it's important that when we have the opportunity to take a look at the work of people of color, that we consider we consider more than just the fact that it's coming from a photographer of color. Because the best the best work, especially when it comes, especially when it comes to photography, comes from really gen a genuine, honest sincere and raw, raw place. And I think that you'll find that <laughs> each of these photographers, though they're, you know, photographing different, different subject matter, using very different approaches, um, are all achieving that in their own way. And that the art is successful if you're able to look at it and see something of yourself in it. It's also successful if you see something that contradicts something that you may have thought about some aspect of what they're covering. The work is successful then. And if you just derive a pure aesthetic satisfaction from just looking at the work, again, it's successful. And I think that, that today, as you look at the work, even though we are celebrating Black History Month, um, 
take the time to appreciate it in all the myriad ways that you would appreciate any piece of art. And, uh, and I just feel honored to be able to share this virtual stage um, with these photographers today. And um, we're gonna start with uh, Gregory Prescott. I'll let them each introduce themselves and tell us a little about themselves and uh, get a chance to enjoy their work. Gregory, take it away. Hi, how you doing? Good evening. I'm Gregory Prescott. Um, so I've been, I moved to LA over 19 years ago. Um, and so my body of work has always been geared more towards portraits, uh, the human body and fashion and, and um, editorials and so forth. And the thing with me is um, I really saw that it was like a lack of people of color in fine art photography. So that's kind of like what I've been more focused on. My inspiration for picking up the camera is was um, Herb Ritz back in the late 80s. And so a lot of people say that, you know, they could see that in my work, my inspiration of being Herb Ritz. I've always been into like very sculptural lines, light and shadow and, and so forth, creating shapes with the body and strong portraits and just showing the beauty of people of color. That's always been my um, inspiration. So I, I basically shoot um, um, females, male uh, models. Um, this model I shot some years back. Um, I like sort of like simplicity, sort of like a fashion look also. Like um, she's was like a fashion model. So things that are very clean, tasteful. Um, I always try to work towards images you can hang on the wall is what I try to go for. So this, once again, you know, I spoke about how I like to create shapes with the body and so forth, more sculptural, statuesque, you can say. Um, so yeah, this was shot in San Diego on the beach. This is actually the cover of my latest coffee table book called Social Distance. I got a book right here. So I shoot a lot in locations. That's um, at the dry lake bed. That's like past Lancaster, like the Lancaster area. So I come up with crazy ideas, but once again, creating the shapes with the hat and the bodies under it. This was also at the Dry Lake Bed. She was a dancer, very amazing. Um, but her wrist had actually did a photo like this years ago, similar to this uh, with Naomi Campbell. And I actually didn't realize that until after I shot this photo and then I saw the Naomi Campbell image and I'm like, oh, Herbert's already did this, or something similar to this, but uh, he's definitely was my inspiration. This is also uh, a mixture of fashion and body. He's a dancer, and that's also at the dry lake bed. Um, I love the dry lake bed because it's just so open and has great light. So I frequent there a lot. This is a friend of mine from Haiti. So we did like a little play with the, um, his locks. Made like a, it's like a Ferris wheel or something with the locks. But it's my take on a portrait of him, a Haitian portrait. This is a model I used to shoot in Brooklyn. So I spent um, four years in New York, plus I, I visit there a lot. So basically we was just walking around in bed I pretty much did this whole like editorial um, in Brooklyn in bed -Stuy. So this is um, 
this is like one of my most popular photos. It's called Magnolia. And um, I actually shot this like near Korea down. Me and my friend, we were just walking around the block, had my camera on me. And the Magnolia is one of my favorite trees because it reminds me of Louisiana. My parents live in Louisiana. And as we was walking around the block, I saw a magnolia tree and I just picked the flower off the tree and this shot came and I didn't know it was gonna become so popular at the time. You just really never know, you know, which gonna, you know, where your pictures go. So this is done real, really well for me. This is, um, this is basically was at, it's at a restaurant in, I guess that's considered Inglewood. It's like literally right across the street from LAX. It's called Melodies. And it's it's almost like the planes are about to land on top of the restaurant. It's a very noisy restaurant, but it's pretty cool. So um, I just noticed how close the planes were coming to the restaurant. So I took a ladder out there one day and brought my friend out there and had him stand on the ladder and just took the shot. It was just an idea I had. This is what it came, came up with. It almost looked like he's touching the plane. That's how close the planes are. Like the runway is literally across the street from the restaurant. These are the sand dunes, um, glamorous sand dunes. Um, and I had on the way to the sand dunes, I thought about picking up an umbrella, the umbrella. So we stopped at Target on the way to the sand dunes and I just picked up the red umbrella and shot that. So I actually went there just a week ago. I go there like once a year. It's like a four hour drive, so I don't go there too much. But that's the thing I love about California. So many locations, nature locations. I'm from Texas and there is no locations in Texas. So I'm taking advantage of California while I'm while I'm out here. This is a model I shot. And I don't even think I had the idea of the cigarette at first, but then while she was getting her makeup done, she started smoking. And I was like, oh, that'll be a cool picture. I know we don't shoot people smoking, but I thought it was really cool. I like the contrast with her skin, the tank top and her skin and the cigarette. So I like thick hair, very theatrical, bouffant hair. So sometimes I'll go on Etsy and just search for bouffant wigs. And I met this designer. She created these metal body armors. And so um, she loaned it out to me. So I call this photo Desert Warrior. She has this like warrior look. Another friend of mine, we were on my rooftop of my apartment and the makeup artist was like pouring water on her as we were shooting. <laughs> so it was wet and sexy. And this is another very popular one of mine is um, White Feather. And I shot this in New York. When I was living out there, I used to test models with the agencies and so forth. They'll send models over for me to shoot and. I just had this idea to put the white feather up there to contrast with her skin. And that is it for my slideshow. Did anyone have any questions? Uh, this is Ibadi and X. I, yeah, I, I, you know, you you mentioned, you know, how Herb Bridge was an influence, and around that same time, you know, uh, Robert Mapplethorpe was a very mm -hmm. popular photographer, also photographing the black subject and in the, during those periods you know in the 80s it was it was seen sort of as a sort of an exotic departure from what had happened before mm -hmm. but now we're looking at it decades later you know even though you may have been inspired by you know herb Ritz and other photographers of that period how do you see your work being different uh, as compared to how they rendered the black body? 
Um, for me, I, for me personally, is the fact that I am using more people of color. I mean, to be honest with you, um, her Ritz shot people of color, maybe more so celebrity wise, but when it came to like artistic stuff, it was really kind of like Naomi Campbell was like his only black model, you know? So he didn't really like have a lot of black models. He shot black people, but it was more just celebrity um, on work. Um, so I think my style, you know, is sort of her wrist as far as photographing the body in a classic way. Robert Maplethorpe was more edgy. Um, his stuff was more sexual, I would think. Um, you know, a lot of his, his stuff was. Um, really, to be honest with you, there really aren't that many Black photographers that shoot body. Um, I feel like Black people still have this stigma about the body as just being something sexual and not as artistic as it could be or should be. And so that's kind of like what I'm trying to showcase in my work the artistry of the body, but using people of color, showing more diversity in fine art photography. And uh, one of the questions I, I, I have for you, because I've, I've been seeing your images on Instagram and I've just really been stunned at how beautiful uh, they are. Uh, you. you know, the line, the shape, the tonality, the way that you render, you know, the dark skin. Talk to me a little bit about you know, the the technical choices that you make in terms of how you shoot it, how you process it to get that look because you, you know, it's to render, you know, darker skin in, in a way that it's really beautiful where the texture and basically the glow is revealed is not an easy thing. So how do you achieve that? I get asked that a lot. <laughs> I think for one, it is my lighting. I, I'm a natural light photographer. I love shooting natural light. Um, so, I mean, of course I shoot everything in color and I switch everything to black and white in, in Photoshop. I just kind of go for more darker tone and in, in add, adding a little bit more contrast when I'm doing my editing. I try to keep things to look more raw and not glossy, you know, not too overly edited. I see that a lot these days is where photographers go into the editing process and people start looking not even real anymore. And I try to stay away from that, and, you know, not edit so hard but then make my tones a little bit darker, adding a little bit more contrast, especially with darker skin. I think it just looks great. Now, I also, with my styling, I normally style my models in all white clothes or all black, um, or if I do shoot in color, I normally try to style in very bright clothes. because I think it's just a great contrast with the skin. So, but with the editing, it is kind of like, I try to darken it a little bit, put a little bit more contrast punch in it, but still keep the skin natural. You, you answered this question partly, but one, a person uh, who says they really like um, the, the, the look, but, but they're wondering about um, your use of natural light versus, you know, using strobe. Yeah, I rarely use strobes. I tried it when I was living in New York because of course, five months out of the year, you can't go outside. <laughs> I had a backyard in New York. So I used to, my backyard was my studio. But then when it got snowed over, I couldn't shoot. So I had bought strobes and I was trying to shoot. And it was just for my taste, my work, it would just look too commercial. You know, commercial is more popular in LA <laughs> so that's where everybody's like going for or whatever but um i don't know it's just i've always leaned more towards um um just using the sun people are always ask me what type of lighting do you use i was like god's light 
And that's a great thing about LA also. It's like, I never have to look at the weather or nothing. You know, we have our little short rainy season in the winter, but the rest of the year, just like, you only have to look at the weather. Where I lived in New York, I had to get up every day and look at the views, watch the weather, see what's going on, plan out my week according to the weather. So <laughs> that's just what I do. Oh, thanks, Gregory. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, uh, Alexis, but if you still have questions for Gregory, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll try to uh, go to them um, before we're done today. But uh, Alexis Hunley, it's, it's all yours. Um, my name is Alexis. I'm an LA based photographer. Um, my work kind of lands between the editorial and documentary um, in terms of style. Uh, I taught myself how to shoot in 2017 and have just been running with it ever since. Um, I'll kind of work through some of my images over the last few years. Um, and if you guys have questions, let me know. Anybody? All right. So when I sit and think about my work, um, I've had to do some reflection lately. Um, the sort of through line is intimacy and love. That's That's kind of what drives all of the images that I tend to make um, across subjects, across clients. Um, and what sort of originally started off as like a project more centrally focused on like lovers and friends and like commentary on romantic intimacy has kind of opened up into a broader project on just the importance of intimacy and all the different facets of love. Um, primarily focused on touch. Um, coming into 2020, um, I had already been working on a project focused on intimacy and touch um, all through 2019. And so once we were in lockdown, um, it just seemed like the perfect moment to really continue with this project because so many of us were stuck inside um, without the ability to connect with our friends, our family, our loved ones in a physical way. Um, and a lot of people were touch start, including myself. And so through most of my work, um, I've realized like I'm not really creating images for anybody else, it, it, it's for me. Everything that I make feeds a different part of, of my soul, essentially. You know, wherever I am emotionally, and mentally is gonna come out in the images that I produce, particularly those where I'm just out creating for myself. But even for clients, I'm, there's always gonna be an element of me in them. Um, and so similar to Gregory, I typically use the sun as well. You know, being self-taught, I didn't really have the budget or the funds to be buying lights or to get studio time. Um, and so I just used what I had, the sun and a reflector um, and friends. And I almost prefer it, one, because we're in LA and the sun is perfect here, but also because it gives you a freedom to focus around that central point of light and be constantly chasing it as it's changing. Like it versus when you have a strobe in a studio or anywhere else, like it's, it's very constant, but this is when I'm using the sun, I'm always finding little surprises. And so when I have the opportunity um, for client work, I'll always, always try to implement um, some, some shoot time on location when possible. Um, as I was kind of working through these yesterday, um, I was thinking about how my goal ultimately with a lot of this work is for people to walk away feeling something. Um, if I don't feel something, I'm usually not going to share it. But my hope is that everybody who comes into contact with, with my work, it resonates on an emotional level. Um, you know, composition is important. Color is really important to me you know, light, but ultimately I want you to have that gut punch moment, whether it's joy, whether it's it's fear, frustration, rage, um, despair. I just want people to feel something. And then I feel like I've done my job essentially. Um, 
yeah, that's, that's kind of where I've landed. You know, I'm constantly changing. I'm constantly looking for ways to grow um, and try new things and expand. And so this, this is where I am right now. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, kind of where things move as we, as we round out this year and head into 2023 and even five years from now, like what, what these images look like, what continues to remain the same um, and what, what I haven't even thought of yet. Yeah, and that's, that's it. I think I only have a couple more in here. Um, I, I, when I look a lot at, at your pictures, whether it's your portraits or whether it's sort of the images that appear more candid, there's a real um, genuineness to them mm -hmm. that I love seeing. Um, do you think, how much does you making a conscious choice to try to express something in your work play in that genuine genuineness coming out as opposed to say just making pictures for the sake of making pictures that's a really good question um immediately what came to mind was um i was documenting the protest here in la uh throughout 2020 and one of the things that i i realized you know a few weeks in was that a lot of the images that, like you said, I was intentionally creating, looking for, like those moments were a direct reflection of where I was emotionally. Um, they they focused on the fear I had, the sadness, the rage, or you know, sometimes when when there was too many emotions swirling around, I would look for moments where people were touching and holding, and like those gentler moments to sort of ground myself. Um, and so, more recently because I've, I've had that realization, it is much more intentional. Whereas before I was doing it on instinct um, to sort of, you know, ground myself emotionally without even realizing it. So now, now that I know that I can lean into that even further. And when it comes to, you know, you mentioned that you're collaborating with your, your, your friends. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people that are really close to you and know you um, yeah. can be not the best subject matter because they're trying to please you right but you want to unless it's something that's not posed that's not contrived it's really natural can you talk about you know how you work with with people especially people who you know to get to Absolutely. the point where you can elicit that I've had this question come up before and I agree there are family members of mine who know no matter what I do, it's always going to be more difficult. I'm going to have to maneuver a little bit more. But like a lot of my work, this is my cousin, Evan. A lot of my my work through the years has been through just her trust in me and that intimacy that we have as family members allows me to push. But also like what ultimately what I'm looking for is like, let me see you. If you trust me enough to let me see you, then we can make something like these are my neighbors. Um, kids, I sh have been shooting them since I began, um, you know, in 2017, like they trust me and they give me the space to work around them as they are, instead of trying to pose and to put on, you know, airs. And that's what gives me the, the images, because this is how I see them, ultimately, like they're allowing me to share with all of you how I view them. And that is terrifying for some people. And I understand, I don't particularly enjoy being photographed. It's very vulnerable, um, but I don't take that trust that they give me lightly. Uh, you're, you're showing people in their own environments. I know that you did a, pr a project like in the Crenshaw district, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, you're showing people where they live in their environment and, you know, how conscious are, are you in terms of, you know, showing place, you know, when you're creating these photographs, especially in contrast with how Black people are usually seen or not seen? 
Oh, that's that is quite a question. I think particularly like you brought up the the Crenshaw project that that was that's been a really important and ongoing project for me because I was born here in LA, but I didn't grow up here. I didn't move back until my senior year of high school, and so I didn't get to spend my formative years in communities with people that look like me. I didn't get to go to school or to the grocery store or play on sports leagues with black people. I didn't have neighbors that were predominantly black. And so moving here um, so late, like I, I felt a hunger for this sense of community. And so as we've kind of moved, you know, through the last several years, as I'm sure you all know, gentrification is moving along steadily. The train has come in on Crenshaw. Um, people are being priced out of their homes. And so I knew that I needed to document these people in these spaces in a way, particularly for myself, because I wasn't going to be able to like, this house has already been flipped. These people are gone. Um, and so it's become even more intentional in the last three years to aggressively um, document my, my neighbors, my people in these spaces that may not exist in two, three, five, 10 years. Well, thank you so much. And again, um, if you have any questions for Alexis, please put it in, in the chat. And um, we'll go to uh, Kwam. Uh, well, Dunsi, am I saying that correctly? Yes, uh, you are. So, go on. Oh, you are. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to blow through a few of these images, and then maybe I'll, at the end I'll talk about them. Okay, yes. so for my for the most part, the way I work, uh, um, and I've been doing this for a while, is I sh I'm always being so same thing as uh, I think Alexis was saying. I self thought. So I shoot, I picked a bunch of different images and different, um, um, sorry, uh, artwork that I do. So I shoot all the time. I, besides documenting, I have to shoot. So what I do is I do silk screen paintings or I do collages or I do, um, this is just for my fine art stuff. Um, you know, obviously if I'm getting, mostly on film. So I was gonna say, sorry, I'm on film. So at times if it's an assignment, or editorial or some commercial work, obviously then that's digital and that's different. Most of those I didn't include here. But these are just personal things. So I document and then I use it for the things, either they were in the zine or they're part of a, uh, like I said, uh, it's going to be part of a collage or self screen painting. Or I sometimes put them on transparency in the light box. So these are just some of the images, some of them in color. Um, I think all of these are actually on film. Some are 35 millimeters, some are medium format. Um, so I'm just going to kind of blow through some of these. Just so you can see. And then also what I do is I actually shoot on um, Fujifilm. I still have the stocks that I bought years ago and then um, that I have. And I have a passport image that I shoot as well. So I have a, a series that I'm doing that I shoot artists and friends of mine as well with the artwork in their space. And that's what this is, a sample few of those. This is um, actually a sculpture piece. There were film images all shot on film and Polaroid that were transfer onto um, transparency film and then encased in an acrylic case. Uh, and this was part of a show, a Hollywood show that I did um, that was titled House Keys in Hollywood. And at the time was about the awards um, and then the whole campaign of um, uh, Oscar So White. And this was sort of a way of saying people can have their own awards or kind of take on their own awards. And that's what this is. So this is all the, the sculptures, but this is just a few select images or a few, sorry. Uh, from the scope. So these are sculpture pieces. Um, and these are something more recent. These are shot on slide films. Um, they were shot in Nigeria. Um, There's black and white as well. I shoot also, I do motion. There's always a narrative to my work. Um, that's just the way so I go about it. But anyway, these are some images that I shot as well in Lagos and then in Korodun Surulere uh, as well for something coming up um, that I document and shot some stuff. A few of these images, I believe, will be part of the pop-up show that's coming with um, LSCP. Um, again, this is a Polaroid image that was done in camera with a mirror of an artist um, the, um, that, yeah, was done with a passport camera as well. So I use a lot of vintage cameras as well. Um, I shoot digital as well, too, but just for, uh, these are just some samples. But these are film images. Obviously, this is black and white. This is in color. 
Um, these are sculpture pieces that were part of a show that I did um, that actual images were shot on Polaroid. You can't tell from this, but it has an effect to it, somewhat like a 3D effect. So they shot on Polaroid, the image is shot, and then I paint over them so you don't see the image. Um, so this actually has several Polaroids lined up. I think there are four of them that are lined up. Um, they all have images. So technically, if you take them apart and then take off the paint, you'll be able to see the image or shot on them. So there's several process for them to dry, shoot the images, paint over them, dry them, put them in this uh, scope, um, glass case as well. And this is supposed to be in heart. Again, these are Polaroid images as well. They were shot, then that was painted over. Um, this is just an installation um, photo from uh, an exhibition that this is a, a piece of emotion um, this or this was a, I believe this is a digital image. I shouldn't super eight as well, but anyway, um, this emotion is just a still from a motion piece um, that was part of a show that a friend of mine shot the gallery um, install, and then that's what this image is from. Um, anyway, this is again self screen. I was saying earlier, this is a, a box that was painted. It's called stash box, but it's an image that I shot, and then I selected pull out of that image and they had a silk screen onto this box and it was sort of it's called stash box um and there would be skaters that were included on that this is again from the, the same image from previous it was a full black and white image it was shot on a ramp and then what i did was i had a uh, a series called um that was i think the reagent anyway where i took images from it and then uh illuminated certain parts of the of the of of the uh, of the image and this particular one with the skaters that were being shot all these um, spectators and photographers um, this is from the same series um, as well this was on a watercolor paper um, this again where an image was shot on film I think these were media formats but then I still screen them on a forty by forty so they were all done in red but they're film images that were still screened onto a canvas on a forty by forty canvas. Um, this is just an image. These were part of a show as well. These were short shadow medium formats. Uh, I think it was an Agfa. I think that's what it was. Anyway, it's short medium format image that um, they were shot. Uh, this was a cell screen, actually. This is a cell screen on uh, watercolor paper of a Lackawanna image. Um, these are, oh, here's another kind of a sculpture piece. This is a pizza box, obviously. And what I did is I cell screen the top of it and then put an image, printed an image in it, and then put um, acrylic on top of it. You can't tell from this. But this way, when the box closes, this is another one of the image. Um, so I do a lot of sculpture pieces. This is sort of a kinetic. This opens up. It's not open here. But normally, it's again, it's a collage piece of Polaroids. There, it's kinetic. Same thing with this. Same thing. So anything I shoot, um, this is a good example of again a Polaroid that was all shot images, but then I paint over them. Um, they're completely white as well. And that camera to me was a sculpture piece. Uh, again, this is a 40 by 40 canvas piece. There was a was an image that I shot and then I had a silk screen black over it. Um, and then this was part, it was just, I always have a photo or something, even if you don't think there is, there's always a photo or aspect of a photo in my work. So this was a sculpture piece. I think it was a themed um, group show. They involve clocks. And then what I did was I kept everything pristine. I took the clock apart, put a Polaroid image in it. And then, um, and then these obviously baggies in there as well. So um, instead of just normally self screen or do something, what I did was I just I disassembled the clock and then added the Polaroid image and then put it back together and then actually put it back in the box and then gave it back to the curator. And then they took it out of the box and hung it on the wall. Um, these are just film images that I document quite a bit as well. Um, and then these were I was I think referring to earlier the kinetic sculpture images I do. Um, and then this was just a salon grid wall of Polaroids. And this was actually, um, it took me a couple of years to put this together, but what this was, was all over Los Angeles. You can't tell because the image is so small. I went documented on all over Los Angeles and the locations and all these things. And there was a, uh, a grid, excuse me, a grid as to where these images were from and where they were documented in Los Angeles. And there were Polaroid put on the wall um, as well. So those were, those are, I forgot how many Polaroids they were, but I shot, they, took me about a, you know, about a year to put it together, a couple of years to get the whole project done. So that's what this is from. It's all Polaroids that were sampled on the wall from that particular project. So I always have some kind of theme or narrative to it. Um, I try to do research prior to it. Uh, if I'm doing an exhibition or a group show, or if I have a new series coming out, whether it's for a zine or I'm preparing for a book or something, 
Um, and then this is just, I think it was a medium format image that was shot. Um, this, you know, you guys saw the images earlier. Um, again, this was a documentation for something, I forgot what it was. It was for work. I think I shot it for something digitally and then I shot a film image for myself. And I think this was on a slide film. Um, same same um, setting, but in black and white. And uh, that's it. This is really interesting work. Um, I don't know whether you are an immigrant or the child of immigrants. Which of the two? Child of an immigrant. So I'm immigrant. My parents are Nigerians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, child of an immigrant. First generation American. Okay. That's me too. And, um, you know, it's, 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 when I look at your images, you know, what I see, even though you're using a variety of different mediums and different approaches and different subject matters, you are really exploring a lot about culture. And one of the things that I like about it is that the way that you're exploring LA is like LA on the periphery, right? It's not the kind of stuff that you normally see on television and, 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 and movies. And I'm wondering how being the son of an immigrant, mm -hmm. that, you know, somehow having a foot in, you know, being an outsider, but also having a foot being an insider, Mm -hmm. How is that? How is that influencing the way that you look at the culture, especially when you decide to sort of tackle, you know, a project and you have an idea about what you want to do? How how, how much of that is do you think is a factor? Um, I'm sure it's part of my. I mean, conscious. I don't know if it's conscious. Part of probably. I mean, that's probably why, the way I move through the world. To be honest with you, I'm so always sort of. Um, uh, I guess another. I'm trying to think another lens. I guess the way I see things, but as far as, sorry, back to your original question is, as far as LA, not necessarily kind of going through the typical, like, you know, even when I said Hollywood, it wasn't typical Hollywood or I watch a lot of films. I mean, I grew up watching films. That's just the way it is. We couldn't watch TV. So we were allowed to watch movies on the weekend and go to the theater. So I know what those areas look like and I've studied them. I know what the typical tourist traps are and things like that. Um, so I find myself interested in sort of the, not even necessarily the underbelly of LA, but the other parts of not even just Los Angeles, but the county and the surrounding city. I think I just don't even think about it, but I just see things that way. I think there's the the typical, I guess, the glossy tier, the tinsel town, and then there's the layers that I'm always interested in. But again, that comes from me always constantly shooting. I always have something on me, whether that's a point of shoot or something. I'm always having to keep track of it. Um, but I always have something that I'll shoot it, even with my iPhone, I'll shoot it. And then later as a reference, I'll document it. So I actually, it's almost um, analytical in a way, even though I don't think that it's like, I'm always constantly documenting. <laughs> it can be get expensive at times, but particularly on film, I'm always just shooting, shooting, shooting. And then I just put it away, don't think about it later. And then when I'm working on something, I'll put it as a reference, just even as a reference, not even necessarily to use it for work. So as for, again, back to as being a child of an immigrant, I think, you just see the world differently. And I think, um, sorry, being in LA, I don't see LA because I see films, I understand film. I enjoy narrative, I know, I know motion. I automatically know, I have a good frame of reference or something that I've seen shot or been, I've seen it before. I have a feeling someone's, you know, they shot there before. That doesn't necessarily have my interest. So I stay away from that. It's just a reflex, I think. I don't necessarily um, gravitate toward that, I think. So I think it's just instinctual. And it's just sort of part of my DNA, I think. Alexis was talking about that the impetus for, for, for her work is comes from a very sort of emotional place. Um, and, but you say you're going to go into a project based mm -hmm. on a concept or an idea. So it, it, is it really, uh, do you see it primarily more as an intellectual exercise that is not as influenced by uh, emotion? Is that a fair statement? Um, well, yeah, I guess it's a fair statement, but if what's funny is emotional, it always have a visceral effect to it though. I think that because originally I think that's what I'm doing. I'm sort of gathering it. Or if I'm thinking of, especially if I have a, I, if I have a, an exhibition or body of work I'm working on. Um, so originally, yes, I sort of, I, I literally write out, uh, uh, almost like a narrative of like, oh, this is what I'm interested in, or this is, or if I even see a quote, if I'm reading an article, or even a synopsis or a film. If I see a snippet of something like a hidden places, like I was recently reading about the power of dog. If I see something that says the hidden places or the hidden, you know, like hidden figures, 
at right now. So it is emotional in that sense. But what I'm thinking about is it's intellectual, I think. So it always is emotional because also I'm a sensitive person. And I think the narrative, even if I don't think I'm putting together a narrative, it always ends up being a narrative. Or what I find at times, I've noticed with other people, there'll be a subtext to it that people have a visceral reaction to it and it'll be similar to what I have. And I didn't think about that when I was put, assembling together the work. It's mm -hmm. just the way it is. But originally when I start, I just, I constantly work whether someone's paying me or not. That's the thing about, at least for me, I'm always working whether I'm getting paid to do it or not. Um, and which can be expensive at times, but so yeah, so that, I guess in that sense, it's intellectual when I'm putting together and kind of putting the idea together or if I'm assigned something to you or if I have a, an exhibition coming up, but then when I, um, but it always have an emotional uh, aspect to it. It's just the way it is. It has to have an emotional aspect to it because I'm just a sensitive person. So it has to, I have to have a connection to it that's not just intellectual. All right. Uh, to the audience, you know, take advantage. You know, you have a wonderful range of talent here. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, of any sort, please uh, you put them in the chat and we'll be glad to, to post them. Um, this is a question for any of you um, to, to answer. Um, you know, all of your work is very personally driven, but uh, I think a couple of you have mentioned in terms of doing sort of commercial work, you know, or um, work for exhibition. And how, how important it is, is it to you to be adhering to your own personal way of seeing and shooting when it comes to the other kind of work that may get you a paycheck? Do you feel like it's sometimes necessary to compromise or do you think it's even more important to adhere to what you know works for you? Is that addressed to me? Anyway, or? Yeah. Um, I'll go first. <laughs> I think if, you, if you're given an assignment <laughs> or you have to do the work, I do the work. I'm not, I can separate that. I can do the work and then still shoot something, you know, right after, you know, quickly on film for myself, but I always do the work because I get it, it's a job. So I don't have, you know, especially if I take the job, if I don't take it, I don't have to. And I don't share a lot of things on Instagram personally. So because of that, there's things I work on, I don't have to share it on Instagram. I can just do the work, get it done and it's gone. So there's times I've shot, I mean, I've done things for people's book, um, you know, like, you know, or even other artists, I've shot spaces and shot their artwork and it's for a book, you know, coffee table book and I've done and got paid and then got a copy of the book and then you don't, you'll never see it in my stuff. It's gone. So, yeah. And then if there's something there for my stuff, I'll grab something. At least that's mine. Well, me personally, I prefer the personal work. That's what really fills my soul. Of course, I'm not going to turn down paid work. I get the paid work. I'll do it. I just don't enjoy it as much. You know, it's just, that's what it is. But when I'm working on my own personal projects, I mean, that's what drives me. So... I mean, I think that's how I feel for it. I have to have a, a balance. I always give myself projects and things to do to keep myself busy. My mind is always going a thousand miles an hour, but it's not going to go a thousand miles an hour when I'm shooting Fashion Nova and stuff like that. It's like when I'm trying to, you know, be creative, do my own creations. That's um, that's what really fills my soul. Okay, cool. No, that's a really good question. Um... I won't do it, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I won't do it. Um, I'll take on jobs that maybe aren't completely what I would usually do. Um, but if it's so far out of alignment that I'm going to be unhappy, I don't care how much money it is. I will say no, because it's not worth it. I've done those jobs and I hated every second of it. And now I have to go cull and edit and those are usually the times where clients are asking for way more than they're giving in the budget. And it's just never worth the stress for me personally. So I just, I'll, I'll take that L and go work on my own project. Um, but then on the flip side, sometimes styles of work or projects that I typically would say no to, like a wedding or family portraits, um, if people are coming to me and they're looking specifically for the style of work that I do, if they really understand that, like, I'm going to do it the way that I do it, then I'm sometimes I'm more open to that. I'll, I'll 
I'll make some wiggle room, even if the budget isn't huge or it's not perfect, but if people are willing to trust me to do what I do, I'm more open to that. But if somebody came and like you said, Gregory was like, Hey, can you shoot, um, can you shoot these stills for our e-commerce site? No, I can't. It's going to, it's going to kill my soul to do that. And you're probably not going to pay me what I'm worth to do it. So I just, I'll send you a reference respectfully. <laughs> With that, um, I want to thank um, our, our presenters for their time tonight. I uh, really appreciate looking at your work. Uh, Ibarinex, you're the best. Thank you so much for your time as well. And everyone here tonight uh, for coming to this uh, event. We truly appreciate it. Thank you.